after that little sojourn to Vancouver, let's get back to work and poke a hole in the roof. This is gonna make a mess right there, so I'm gonna clear this out of the way first. Oh, someone mentioned about clear shrink tubing. I had never heard of that before, so I ordered a stick, stick, tube, whatever. And as soon as I get an excuse to, I wanna crack it out and try it, and I wanna see how transparent it is. Back to cleaning. So if you recall, last time we drilled that hole, but the box ended up being offset to, by this perspective, the right a little bit. So I'm going to cut the hole slightly to the right, a small hole, feel around to figure out where the box is, and then try to center the plate. If you recall, we're going to use this face plate to mount that. Originally I was going to use these banana jacks, but I don't like how the outside is metallic and would be energized. So the gap is more than enough that I, even 100 volts DC, 10 amps, 20 amps, it's not going to arc. But I don't like the idea of something being that close together that's energized on the outside. Considering this is going to be very temporary, I'm going to put this plate up, I'm going to run the wires straight down, and then when I'm done, I'm just going to put a blanking plate over this. There we go. What I'm trying to do here is just get it big enough that I can put my finger up in there and feel around for the joist and for the orange box. Once I've got that, I'll think about where to actually put the plate. Okay, so I can feel right here, well, you can't see anything, but putting my finger up here, I can feel the joist is about here, and I can feel the end of the conduit going into the orange box about here. So, now I got to decide how I want to mount this. Thinking like that will do. With these plates, you don't have to be super concerned about the accuracy because the plate covers so much of the drywall that if you're off by a little bit, who cares? It'll be hidden. But that said, aim to be as close as you can be so that your screw ups are within tolerances. Okay, so the previous paint on my house, before I did my paint job, I believe was oil-based. And the latex paint I put on, despite using what I thought was good primer, it likes to peel. So what I'm doing is I'm just coming along with a knife to literally cut the paint. So that if it starts to pull, like if the paint actually starts to peel off, it'll hit the cut and stop. You shouldn't have to do this, but if you own a house old enough that it was painted with oil paint, well, them's the brakes. See how it's just, the paint is literally just peeling off. That's with a layer of high quality, I thought, primer. <laughs> and the latex paint just still peels off. Incredibly annoying. Thought, oh balls. Yeah, I'm definitely doing a new paint job. Oh, how annoying. That's guy. Come out a bit more. Okay, 
What's stopping me right now is you can see there's a ledge. That ledge needs to go into the drywall. So I've got to keep relieving the drywall a little bit. Sometimes I wish I was on your side of the camera where I could just do a quick edit and it's done. <laughs> go. That's its flush. Let me bring the camera up so you can see what I'm doing. So up in there you can see where the conduit is. You can see where I cut up the orange box a little bit trying to get it to fit in or to get the knife in. That is fairly thick. So I need to go get some longer screws. I'll be right back. So conveniently I don't need to worry about the longer screws because this one comes with them. So yeah, to use these, fold them up, to squeeze them in. And once they're through the wall, you push this piece backwards. I'm gonna have to do the first one anyway, so I'll do it now. Sort of like that. Now, normally what you would do is you would push it all the way up into the wall and then using the thickness of the wall as a lever, then you would fold it over. But because the orange plate's in the way, I need to start at this side. <laughs> oh my God, I'm a dumbass. Let's try doing this the right way. You don't get many tries bending these because it's not exactly the highest quality metal and metal fatigue sets in fairly quickly. When you're doing this, be careful not to drive the screw into your finger. Okay, so that snap you heard was the screw finding purchase on that leaf in one of the holes. Actually, let me see if I can show you this. Focus, focus. There we go. Okay, I'm sorry if this is going to be a little shaky. Come on, focus. There we go. So you see how the screw comes in here, up, and through the leaf, and pulls down on it, and it uses that leaf to squeeze against the wall. And that actually makes this really nice and sturdy. So when I'm done, because this is temporary, I'll be able to put now this blanking plate over top of it and hide it. Not ideal. I mean, I could if I really wanted to plaster it over, but I kind of like the idea of having a conduit to the top of my roof for future use. Also, Jess, I've got your shirt dirty. So, a brief, I don't know, what would you call it? Lesson? I hate saying a brief lesson because it implies that I'm in a position to be a teacher. <laughs> I'm not, but I have done this before. So let me show you how I do it not saying it's the right way to do it. So this here is a fish line. As you turn it, you have this, ah, this one's slightly beaten up, metal band that comes out and it's rather stiff. So you use it to feed up through conduit to the other side. And generally what you'll do is you'll take, I've heard people refer to this as mouse line, um, pull line. I, what do they call it? This is Klein, pulling line. I mean, what it says on the tin, it's for pulling things. So what I like to do is take some pulling line, take some electrical tape and tie this off. And the idea behind this is that you use the stiff metal band to push the pulling line wherever it is you're going to go. Just take some electrical tape. Oh. You whip yourself in the face. Come. <laughs> Trying to do this on camera is so, it's, it's fun. It's fun, it's okay, it's fine. I find that the, can you see that? The bottom of the loop here tends to snag on things. So I like to run the tape along the bottom just so it creates like a cone shape or a ramp. So that if I go to pull it back, it doesn't snag on the edges of the conduit or a box or something like that. I'm gonna take this and just toss it on the floor. I know you can't see this, but I'm sticking it into the end of the conduit. 
as with all of these things, getting it started is the tricky part. There we go. So now it's started. And I back this off and I push this up. Hi, can you see this? I hope so. So I back off the fish line and I push it up into the conduit. One thing with the pull line, I find every now and then it just stops feeding out. I don't know if it's just because I got a really cheap one, but you just got to kind of grab it and give it a pull to get it going again. Come on. Okay, I'm gonna leave you right here for a second. I know I left these around for a reason. If you can't get a grip on the wire, grab a pair of vice grips or something. There we go. Now I can push this up. And I'm just repeating this until I feel the other side of the fish hit the top of the solar deck. Okay, feels like I've hit the end. I'm trying to pull enough slack out now so that I can place this on the floor and it doesn't pull the fish line back out of the conduit. I should mention, I may or may not need to use this, but I wanted to show you guys that it is premium synthetic wire and cable pulling lubricant. Yes, it's cable lube. So if you've got a bundle of wires, you're gonna fish through conduit and it's close to the same diameter and you're finding there's a lot of resistance, you basically just squeeze this onto the wire as you're pulling it through. It, it's lube. I'm, <laughs> we're all adults here. <laughs> Anyways. It evaporates really, it, it's slimy, it's gross, but it works really well. And it evaporates pretty quickly and just leaves like a little white residue and it's gone. This stuff, when you're struggling to pull line, is a godsend. By the way, um, this fish, the pull line, and the wire lube, any major home improvement store, Home Depot, Bunnings, Rona, whatever, should sell all of these things in the electrical department. I'm gonna look up your name and put it in the here, but somebody made a really good comment about using a traditional breaker in the solar deck. It's gonna get really hot up here. And one of the problems with traditional breakers, well, one of their good sides is that they have a bimetal plate. Big Clive did a great video on this. I'm gonna see if I can find it and if I can, I'll link it in the description. Where if the plate starts to warm up, eventually once it passes a certain temperature, it trips the breaker. This box being up in the roof, black, and in direct sunlight, it's not a stretch to think that that's gonna trip that bimetal trip, bimetal plate trip, whatever you call it. So, what this is, and you see Andy using something similar, is it uses traditional fuses. There's no bimetal plate in this, but it's still a DIN rail fuse holder. So when I open this, I'm going to replace the fuse with this. Now, my panels are exposed right now, so there's going to be a lot of voltage. So I'm going to clip this in and then move one wire over at a time. There's my mess line. Ah. Excellent. Can you see what I'm doing? So. I should have brought a pair of pliers up. I'm going to be back up here, so I'll bring some pliers to tighten these down. But for now, this will keep them from falling out. So I put these colors on, and I put this color on, and now I'm going to swap out the traditional breaker with the fuse holder style breaker. The load is gonna to go to, for now, the conduit, but later the BX when this install becomes permanent, and the line is gonna to go to the solar panels. So knowing that, I'm gonna put this like that. So let's move the solar panel wires over one at a time, and I should Remind that at this moment, the solar panels are powered up. Okay, let's 
bring this over here as far as I can. Does this? Okay, what am I doing wrong? Okay, put that over there carefully. Oh, this bit's too fat to fit down here. I'll be right back. I need to get a different screwdriver. All right, this screwdriver fits in better. I'm gonna have to be very careful once I pull this positive one out. There it goes. Can you see that? The copper on the negative is, pot is sticking out a bit where the ground or where the hot is not. I'm gonna try to reseat the negative. Okay. Well, anyways, there you go. So I'll get the this one out. So that's gonna come downstairs now. These are not connected to anything. I'm just getting them out of the way for now. So they don't risk shorting out against this. The grounding wires though, I'm gonna absolutely connect. So this is the grounding wire in one of the BX's going to the grounding rail. Okay, and next time I'm up here, what I will do is I'll strip out some of this grounding wire from some spare wire I have, and I'm going to run it down the conduit that these wires are in that goes to the solar panel, and I will tie it to the frame to ground all the framing. So the next step now is to pull two pairs of these down. I've got another pair of panels and another pair of rails on order. So sooner than later, I'm actually gonna have the four cables going through that conduit to two different breakers. I'm gonna run them in two pairs of two. So as you can see, perfect example of what might happen on the sailboat, the two panels that are here are gonna hit, get shaded before these two panels get shaded and vice versa in the morning, it's evening now. With a sailboat, as the sail swings, as the boom swings, your panels are gonna be coming in and out of shade. By having them on two separate pairs, each pair going to its own MPPT controller, each controller can try to adapt or account for the optimal voltage and amperage. They'll be able to chase their own optimal voltage amperage rating for the given shading condition independently. So these two being partially shaded will cause a loss of power input, while these ones are still generating full power, and vice versa. Knowing I'm going to do that, I actually want to run two positives and two negatives. Now, the way I'm going to run them, I'm not going to be able to tell one from the other, but that's okay. I'll show you what a tone generator is very shortly. So I've got the two ends of the wire for the positive. I'm going to do the same thing for the negative. So one of the tricks I found that makes it easier to fish, stagger your wire, uh, can you see that? Stagger the wires. If you run them all equally parallel, you have a big fat blob at the end that's harder to pull. I'm always quite generous with the tape because there's nothing quite as annoying as being halfway through a pull and your pull line separates from the cable you're actually pulling. So the size of the conduit entrance relative to the diameter of the wire I'm pulling, it doesn't leave a lot of free space. So I'm gonna to wanna to pull the fish line out first and then I will start to pull the wire through. Almost certainly it's gonna snag up on me a few times on roofing tiles or whatever. So I expect to be running up and down the stairs a fair bit. I have my lube if it feels like it's jamming up because it's just too tight in the conduit, but it's a pretty straight shot with no bends, so I don't actually expect to need that. You can see this isn't being drawn in because it's not connected anymore. So this is just to get the fish out of the way. Fish is out of the way. So now, yeah, I'm gonna have to go back up on the roof 
and push it down a little bit. I'll squeeze some lube in it. The lube evaporates very quickly, so I'm gonna have to run down really quickly and pull on this, and I'm gonna be going up and back a few times. One of the great things of DIY is that it forces you to get some good exercise. So as long as I can push this, I will do so. And because this is relatively stiff wire, I can probably get it most of the way. Okay, it's about as far as I need. I don't need lube though. This is moving perfectly well. You can see how much space there is. I thought it was gonna be tighter than that. So I still have lots of wire down here. So the problem is I'm pulling down, the wire needs to go this way. <sighs> I'm leaving the camera here. I'm just gonna run up and down. All I'm gonna be doing up top is pushing it down a little bit. I'm hoping that pulling this out was enough to, I, I'm hoping that the pull cord was actually what was banging or jamming it up. So I've got that out. Let's see if I can push it a bit further. This will be an interesting test of the range of these wireless microphones. Yep, I'm able to push it again, so I think it was just jammed up from the, from the pull cord. Okay, stuck again. That actually might be me coming out the other side. <laughs> I noticed the cord was moving. <laughs> the cat found it entertaining, apparently. All right. Yep, there it is. That's the end of the wire. <sighs> Off camera, I had somebody, well, my daughter, who's not going to be on the videos, help pull on these while I pushed from upstairs. Had I been alone, what I would have done is I would have found something really heavy to hang off of the pull line, like, I don't know, five, 10 kilograms, so that there was a constant downward force and then gone back up on the roof and pushed it. But she got home, that was tremendous help, made it a bit easier. So this is all of the slack. I'm gonna take you back up top and you can see how much slack is up there. I don't know if the camera turned itself off again. Uh, what I did was, I've taped off each of the ends so that there's no conductor exposed. And I've got the four wires all sitting relatively far apart. So there's no chance for them to make contact with each other or with anything else electrical. I had wanted to use my tone generator, which normally you would connect that onto a conductor and it puts basically a radio frequency on the wire and then you can go with this and touch the wires and you'll hear it start to put out the same tone that's being put onto the wire and you can say ah okay so this is cable one this is cable two cable three cable four but the battery's dead so instead what i'm going to do is i am just going to connect these to the fuse holder breaker thingy so that one of the reds will be positive one of the negatives will be ground for the existing pair of panels then i'm going to come down here and I'm gonna pull the tape off of the grounds and touch the two positives until I figure out which two make up a circuit and then I know the other two are the second circuit. Not ideal, but it'll work. Well, that's annoying. The camera just crashed so bad that it wouldn't turn off when I turned off the power switch. <sighs> I'm starting to understand why good cameras cost so much. Positives on the far side from the camera's perspective. Oh, don't fall down there, please. Okay, that pair is running downstairs. The other pair is spare. The two BXs are spare. I still don't like how much this, new, or this negative is exposed. I don't know if you can see that. You can see that's exposed there and I really don't like that. Now this is live, so I'm gonna pull this out very carefully without touching anything. 
you can't see what I'm doing, but I'm not repositioning the camera. I'm just cutting a little bit of length off the exposed copper. So that hopefully when I push this back in, now it tightens down and there's no exposed copper. Yeah, that's better. Well, it's still not great. Why is it not? Well, it's fine. There we go. That's actually not just kind of fine, that it's actually fine. So you can see how there's no exposed copper here. There's no exposed copper at the top. And I have all the wires I'm ever going to want in this box now in this box. Current and future use. So I'm going to leave this open. I'm going to run downstairs. I'm going to get my multimeter and we're going to check the voltage across here. Make sure that we're actually seeing voltage because I haven't looked underneath the panels to see if the squirrels ate any of the other wires. It's entirely possible they did. So um, yeah, so I'll make sure there's voltage here and then I'll go downstairs and I'll use that same, I'll close this and I'll use the voltage on these wires to identify these two wires in the office. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you that I measured 73.6 volts across here. I don't know why it stopped recording. I closed the breaker and now we're going downstairs. Okay, so voltage DC. So I'm going to pick a random hot, a random ground. The thing about DC voltage you have to be careful about as opposed to AC voltage is that with DC volts, it doesn't let go if you get a shock. Now, I'm over 50 volts, 48.5 or 48 volt nominal, which technically puts me into high voltage DC. If you get a shock with AC, if you've ever gotten a shock off an electrical outlet, it lets you go because the voltage is going up and down, up and down, up and down. And during the transition from plus 120 to minus 120, or plus 230 to minus 230, depending on where you are, it hits zero. And in that moment, you can let go of whatever it is you've grabbed that's shocking you. DC is constant. It clenches your muscles and it holds them. So you have to be very careful around DC voltage. 25% chance, hot, neutral, nothing. One of those is wrong. Okay, I'm gonna leave the hot because that's the one I wanna to touch the least. And I'll bring the other ground. Okay, so the, car, the negative is exposed. So let's try this again. Nothing. So it looks like one of my, my hot was wrong and one of my negatives was right at one point. Let's bring this one over. Keep these well apart. Can you still see that? Third one, positive, negative, nothing. Ugh. Literally going to be the last one or is there just no voltage at all for some reason? There it is. There's my two. Of course, it was the last pair I chose. 74.7 volts. Okay. So now what I need to do is tape off the other pair so that I know they're not being used. Okay, so I'm taping this pair off. And again, I'm staggering them. So if for some reason I connect the other side without thinking about it, which, you know, come on, let's be honest, it's me, it could happen. There's no way that those two ends are going to short because they're not side by side. All right, so that's one pair done. This pair is alive, so I'm going to tape this back up, minimize the chance of there being a short. The positive is the main one I care about. All right, so now I have my two pairs. Let's get this out of the way. This is the first pair. And I am going to run this with something of a service loop. Let's say to about here. Oh, uh, sorry, this is the pair we're not using yet. All the better to practice with. I'm gonna run these into the second set of breakers and then I'm gonna run the pair that I tested to have power on the first set of breakers. Whenever you're cutting power cables, even though I know this is the pair that is not connected to any panels yet and I know it's dark it's still a good habit to not cut both the positive and negative at the same time if for some reason down the road you made a mistake and you were wrong when you cut both wires at the same time the blade becomes 
a bridge, shorting it out, and you get nice big sparks, and sometimes ruins your tool, to say nothing of your eyeballs. So, it's a good habit to always cut one line at a time. I think that's a good range right there. These new cutters are so much easier than the old ones. All right. I don't know if there's a proper standard. If there is, somebody let me know. But up on the roof, I was putting red on the left and um, negative ground on the right. So I'm gonna continue that. My thought is that it's less important what standard you choose and more important that you choose a standard and you stick with it throughout your build. So this is the pair I am not using yet. So what I've done is I've created a couple of stickers. I'm calling the first pair Solar A. So this pair here is Solar B. So that's the first pair done. This is the pair I measured voltage on. Now, because it's dark, there shouldn't be any voltage on it. I realized I didn't have my nice little background lights going. Come on, you can do it. There we go. So it's not great, but more importantly, I can look at each pair now and know what each pair is. Okay, I have fair rules. Are they 10 gauge? Let's take this little bit of scrap and find out. <laughs> Past Madison, you did such a good job. Let's see. So, two in, two out. Two of them, I need eight fair rules total. One end of each of the short jumpers to go from here to the jumper, or to the breaker. Here to the breaker. And then I need a pair of longer ones that terminate in ring terminals to go on the bus bars. So I have a cable plan in mind. <sighs> How do I constantly order the wrong stuff? For the sake of now, what I can do is use these. They're technically too big. You see how huge the ring is, but I believe these are also 10 gauge. Yep, they are. And for the amount of current going into them, only 10 amps, I can pull it tight and there'll be enough surface area. So not ideal, but that's what I'm going to do. I wish I could explain to people who don't make things why making things is so incredibly satisfying. I think this is gonna be the first time I've actually crimped a fair rule. 1210 is right here. <laughs> I mean, it does the job, but it ain't pretty. It made it very rectangular. So this is going to go PV from here. Yeah, you know what, I'm gonna, I was debating whether I was gonna waste putting insulation on these, but I think I definitely am. I need a very narrow flat screwdriver. I don't know if I have a very narrow flat screwdriver. My Nest thermostat came with the perfect size screwdriver. All right, so PV positive. I think that's in. Yep, that's in tight. Oh, the beautiful silence of that thing shutting off. PV negative. Now, if you've got any of these Victron MPPT controllers, you might notice that it's odd. This one has 
seemingly an extra pair of outputs. And it is odd. Most of them don't have that. What is that for? What does that do? I don't know actually yet. Um, it looks like it's for some sort of like programmable load, but I don't know yet. PV positive. Now, one of the things they made very, very, very clear at the training was that going over the input voltage on these MPBTs will burn them out. And one of the things that was particularly of interest to me, because I plan to go to cold climates, I want to go to Scandinavia, I want to go to the Arctic and the Antarctic, and they were saying, and I kind of knew this, but they really hammered it home, that solar panels generate more electricity the colder they are. And generally that's been thought of, at least in what I've been able to hear so far, in the, if your panels heat up too much, they don't generate power, which is absolutely true. But that was always seen as a problem of being too hot. There's also a problem that comes along with the panels getting too cold. And that is, oh, I don't know what that bang was. The, the problem with the panels getting too cold is that their voltage starts to climb quite dramatically. And one of the things I have to look up with the panels I've got is how high does the voltage go as the temperature drops well below freezing? So here in Canada, it is not uncommon for us to hit <clears throat> minus 20 Celsius, minus, th minus 30 Celsius, which, as I understand it, could be the point where the panels start to generate significantly higher voltages than they normally would. So I bought two panels that are rated at, I think, 38. I'll put it in the screen below what they're rated for, like 38 or 40 volts. And I was thinking, okay, well, pair them up in series, and that's 70, 80 volts, give or take. That's a 20% window on the 100 volt input rating. But it might very well be that in really cold climates, the voltage could climb over 100, in which case these are dead, just fried. So I'm gonna have to pull up the tech specs on my panels before winter. And if they have the capability of getting over 50 volts per panel in really cold weather, I'm going to have to replace these with the 15035s, which is the next step up. They'll support up to 150 volts in, 35 amps out. So I need another set of cables that are going to go from here to the bus bars. So I know this is not an ideal configuration. I don't have the right size ring terminals. Nothing about this is permanent. First ground goes into the first one, into the battery negative. The second panel's battery negative. Okay, that's the negative done. Craziest thing with all of this is being aware of how many pieces you have to consider, how many sources of power you have to consider to make sure you don't leave a bus live. You could have power coming from your generator when you have one, your inverter, charger, solar panels, or battery. So if you're working on these systems, you need to consider all of those potential power sources when making sure that a given bus is in fact de-energized. It's a really good habit to get into, and I didn't do this, Hit the bus bars with a voltmeter before you start working on them to make sure that all of the different ways the bus bars could be energized are turned off. Now because these are coming off the bus bars, there's no particular concern. Whoa, fuck! Okay, uh, what's on? Sometimes I think I'm smart. And then something like that happens and I realize, no, I'm a complete dumbass. <laughs> the battery is on the whole time. The bus bar was energized. That whole time I was sitting there talking about, oh, you know, you should hit the bus bars with the voltmeter just to be sure. <sighs> All right, so as I was saying, <laughs> it doesn't matter which of the positive and negative leads I use. I don't have to worry about 
at this point tracking, oh, this is pair A and this is pair B because they're going to the same bus bar. All right, hoping I didn't blow anything. Let me run this under here just to make it a bit prettier. I picked up some BE Direct cables, three meters long. They're longer than I need right now. So I'm running the data cables underneath the power cables. No particular reason, just felt like it. Okay, so MPPT that goes to panel group A is going to be VE Direct 1. Somebody not on my channel made a comment that they shouldn't, or saying, admonishing somebody for hanging out with people who've made mistakes. If you don't hang around with people who make mistakes, you won't hang around with any interesting people. All right, what's going to be the least cluttered way to throughout this? Let's try like this. This breaker here goes to panel group A, which is what I have currently, which feeds into this MPPT controller, which goes into VE Direct 1. The second breaker goes to the second panel pair that is on order but not installed, that goes to this smart solar charger, which then goes to VE Direct 2. This here goes to the smart shunt, the CAN bus to the Quattro. So now all of my Victron devices are coming to the Serbo GX. Everything is off. Perfect. Now you can see the breaker. Okay, so... .15 volt, which makes sense because it's dark. Absolutely nothing on the other one. So this panel is definitely the one because it's picking up a tiny little bit of power from the moonlight. Turning it on, leaving this one off because it's not connected. Turning the battery back on. Pre-charge resistor. Battery on. All right, the servo's booting. Waiting for this to come up. PV chargers. It sees it. Oh, you can't see it. Ah! It sees the PV charger. There's zero watts coming in. In theory, tomorrow when the sun comes up, power should start coming into the battery. So as of right now, the BMS is reporting 19% state of charge, which makes sense. After I finished the last discharge test, I didn't want to leave the batteries at a low state of charge. Because of the invitation to the Victron training, I knew that it was going to be close to a week before I had a chance to set these up and start charging up the battery. So I turned on the Quattro long enough to put some charge into the battery, 19% according to the BMS, enough that I didn't feel bad leaving it for a week. But I turned it off because what I want to do is I want to see how much power am I going to get out of those two panels. The battery size that I have for the panels that I have doesn't make a lot of sense on the surface. You would normally want a fairly large solar array. And if you're building an off-grid cottage type system where it's stationary and you can make sure all the trees are cleared and you can put up lots of panels, absolutely do that. It makes all the sense in the world. But recall, I am going to be going onto a boat where I have very limited space for solar panels. So part of the whole experiment for me is to see how far can I go in keeping my batteries charged up with relatively small amount of panels. Now, to help deal with that, I tried to find the highest efficiency by square meter panels I could get. And I've got these monocrystalline Canadian solar panels the first pair are 330 watt, the pair I have in order are 340 watt, basically the same panels. It, literally the same family, just one step up because that's what they had in stock. 10 watts. Shouldn't make a big difference. If I can get four panels mounted onto the back of the sailboat on the solar arch, I'm looking at a 4 meter by 2 meter, which is 12 foot by 6 foot array of solar panels on the back of the sailboat. That's already insanely large, but it, it's tiny considering the size of my batteries. So I want to see with just one half, and then once I get the other ones, all four, how insanely long is it gonna take me to charge my batteries? It will take a long time. I know this, I understand this. I am okay with this because I plan to use the motor to get in and out of harbors and then turn it off and I'll have the solar panels. If they take four, five, six days to charge the boat back up, so be it. 
It takes a week to charge the battery back up. So be it. I shouldn't be using the motor that much. And when I run the motor, I shouldn't be running it so long that I actually deplete it every time. Of course I can, and I will, but that's also why I'll have the diesel generator for the times where it's completely flat and it's just taking too long to charge back up. But I want to use that as rarely as possible. So this whole experiment is, how far can I go with just four solar panels? And I forgot to turn on the microphone. As you can see, it's really overcast the next morning. I left the solar panels off just to be safe. So I'm going to turn them on. And you can see it gets to about 100, 150 watts. A couple times during the day, it sp spiked up over 400 watts, but it never really amounted to a whole lot during the day. So it's been about 24 hours since I turned on the solar panel for the first time. So you can see we're pulling over 400 watts at times. It's overcast, spitting rain, so there's periods where the sun gets through and periods where there's no sun at all and it gets below 100 watts. I'm not going to have a good sunny day until later in the week, so I figured I would end the video here. It's been about 24 hours now since I connected the solar panels. You can see the battery is now showing 33% charge. It was 19% yesterday when I first turned on the solar panels. So I'm just going to leave this running. I've got the Quattro still off. As you can see here, it's off. So the only charge coming into the battery right now is off the solar panels. I suspect it's going to take most of the week to get it charged back up, if not longer, especially considering the weather's not looking great this week. Cat feeder. So that's all I'm going to do for this video for now. Um, there's actually not a whole lot left still to do. I've got two more panels coming on order and I've got them scheduled to be installed as soon as I get the panels in my hand. And that'll be the last of the hardware. I'm really interested to play with something I learned out at the training. They, you can install a third-party application called Node-RED. I have no idea how it works or what it is, but apparently it allows you to do really complex logic. And I've got some things in mind I want to play with. So there'll be one more solar panel video coming and that'll be the end of the hardware for a little bit. And yeah, we just get into programming and stuff. So I'm the Digital Mermaid. See you next time.